you know you've had a lot of flops in a month when you actually look at yourself in the mirror and say, is it me? Hello, it's Katie Colson here. Welcome to or welcome back to my channel. And today we're going to talk about all the books that I read in the month of September. The first book I read is Rebecca by Daphne du Maurier. Now this was a book that I technically read last month, but it was for my Smut Salon book club. If you don't know, I have a Patreon and we have a book club and we call it the Smut Salon because that's what they call their little coven and bunny, which is like my favorite book of all time. It's not bad. It's not good. It's not bad. Look at a pretty cover. Spine? Absolutely hideous. I gave this two stars and honestly I'm like maybe it's like two and a half. It's like this entire thing is a dream sequence. Everything takes so long to happen. Like the first 14 pages are just her walking to the front door. And does she walk in on the 14th page? No, no, no. She's just staring at the plants. And I'm like I get it. I get it. There's hyacinths. Can we stop talking about it? I'm sorry. Um, and then also she is a very weak character. She's very weak. If you don't know what Rebecca's about, it's a classic. It's a really old book. Okay, this is about a girl who is down on her money, you know, and she gets taken to Manderley, which is this like famous abode on this island, okay? And it's a stunning mansion. She goes there, but everybody seems to like have it out for her because the previous wife, Rebecca, everybody loved her. Okay. And she's like, where's Rebecca? How did she die? Like what's going on? And there's like kind of like a mystery shrouding it and like what happened to her? It's not as good as it seems like it would be. Like that mystery sounds like it's going to be amazing. It's really not. It's fine. I'm not saying the book's bad. Would I suggest it? No. Oh my gosh. Okay. We're going to try to do the thing again. They're all going to fall over though, right? Okay. Anyway, we're going to try. After Rebecca, honestly, I just needed a palette cleanser. So I listened to the audiobook for One of Us is Dead. And I love this cover. This cover is just so interesting. And I honestly was having such a good time reading this book. But the ending, the ending is bad. The ending is bad. Like the ending is so bad. And I honestly was like, I was like, I'm gonna give this three and a half stars. Like, I'm not saying it's a great book, but it's such a good time. But then that ending, I was like, no, you're, ugh, you're two stars. You're two stars. Unfortunately, I think I ended up giving it a two and a half because of my relation to the setting of this book was very interesting. So basically you're following a bunch of very rich wives in Buckhead. And if you don't know, I live in Atlanta and I used to work in Buckhead. So I really know that area very well. I was like, I've met these women before. Like these are real people. Like she wrote about it so realistically. So basically you're following these Buckhead Bettys and they, one of the women, her husband leaves her and gets a fresh like 25 year old Texan girl as a fresh new model. And she is not wanting to be ousted by the rest of these Buckhead women because they're like, oh, you're a divorcee. No, you can't be in our group. And they have like a group of like these Buckhead women that are the ones who put together all these committees and everything. And they all get together at this salon where you have to like be in the group to get into the salon, okay? So one of them or someone ends up dead. And you're trying to figure out how did this happen? What's going on? Like there's a lot of backstabbing, possibly literally, definitely figuratively, definitely emotionally and absolutely a thousand percent verbally. The back slapping compliments, I mean, the backhanded compliments that these women give to each other, I iconic, like iconic. It's so, the rich bitchy energy in this book is chef's kiss. But the ending is so bad. Like I genuinely believe that the author was writing the book having no idea where it was gonna go. And then at the end was like, oh shit. And then like did not have a plan and then just threw together an ending that didn't make any sense. And was like, not only didn't make sense but was really bad, like honestly tragic. So next. Babel by Irof Kwong. This is a book I've been highly, well, not just me, the entirety of the book turnet, everything has been highly anticipating this. So this is the same author, Irof Kwong, as the Poppy War trilogy, which I adored. So this is a standalone, shockingly. It's really big, to be honest. Like the writing is also really freaking small. So this is a dark academia and Irof Kwong is like mega mind. Like she couldn't get any smarter. I, I don't understand. Like her writing is so intelligent. Her, just as a human being, even though she's so young, is so intelligent. 
it's, it's kind of scary. So this is supposed to be about a boy named Robin and during a cholera outbreak, his entire town dies like in front of his eyes basically. And this professor comes and hands him a piece of silver and says like, touch this. When he touches it, the way that it reacts to him and he reacts to it, tells this professor, you're the one I've been looking for, come with me. And then takes him to Oxford and is like, I'm gonna put you up in this college. I'm gonna pay for like your tuition. And basically in this world, silver is like, a magical like basically you can do magic with silver and with language in my opinion the magic system was really weak it was really weak and it was really unnecessary in my opinion like i don't know i just didn't think that the magical like fantasy part of this it wasn't good in my opinion it wasn't good honestly this book just isn't for me it's way too highbrow um which i mean i love the sacred history so like i don't even know if i can safely say that but it's too highbrow for me it's too meandering um there's not enough action there's just so much world building and that's not for me personally like i just don't really care about that and i also felt like the action we did get was way too fast like we would be talking about certain things for so fucking long and then there would be action and i'm like wait who's dead what are you talking what like it just it wasn't for me it wasn't for me. I did not enjoy it. Um, I do think that the cultural representation in this book is fantastic. Um, there is a lot of things being said about like colonialism, like colonizing, all of this different stuff that is fantastic. Um, so historically, the way that R.F. Kuang weaves historical events into this book and into the Poppy War series is fantastic. But unfortunately, I was gonna say I'm gonna give it two stars. I'm, not, I'm gonna give it two and a half because I don't think this book is bad. It's not bad. It's just not for me which I'm like, I guess I could still give it two stars. I'm gonna give it two and a half because I really enjoyed the cultural representation. The Girls by Emma Klein. This is one that I do have very conflicting or like unsure of how I feel about the rating for this book because part of me is, finds it uncomfortable, like the subject matter, the fact that this is like a fictionalized version of a real story, I find a little bit uncomfortable. But then at the same time, I'm like, maybe that means it's great because the author like, did their research and like, I don't know. I don't know. I'm struggling. I don't know how I feel. I ended up giving this three stars. I thought it was fine. Like I enjoyed it. I thought it was fine, but it, it kind of skeeved me out a little bit, you know, at the same time. So I'm not sure. Um, this is about, basically it's about the Manson murders. So she gets pulled into this cult and um, it's her like, why she gets pulled into it, how she gets pulled into it, all this different stuff, the people that are in it, why she doesn't feel like she can leave and if she wants to leave or not and why she likes it there, how other people get involved. And then the Manson murders. Like, you know, I'm not gonna tell you how we get there, but we get there. The one thing that I really enjoyed about this book is that the main character is not in this cult because of Charles, which his name is not Charles in here. I think it's like David or something. It's something different, but um, it's not Charles. The main character, Evie, I think the girl's name is Suzanne. The main character, Evie, is obsessed with this girl, Suzanne, who's in the cult. And she like is, like literally obsessed with her, like loves her, adores her, like wants to be around her. And she gets into the cult because she wants to be close to Suzanne. And I thought that was very interesting. I'm like, okay, I like that we have a cult where the person is not being um, initiated or like brought into the cult because she wants, she's in love with the cult leader. It's because she's in love with one of the followees. So I thought that was cool, but I gave it three stars. I'm not sure how I feel about the Manson tie-in. I don't know. What Moves the Dead by T. King Fisher. I have read quite a few T. King Fisher books this year and I adore her. This is a retelling, retelling, reimagining of The Fall of the House of Usher. So basically this person in this, it's a non-binary character, um, gets a letter from one of their friends from when they were in the army saying that uh, his sister is dying and asks like oh can you come or no sorry the the sister is the one who messages him and says like i'm dying um like basically come and see me for the last time he goes there and there's something wrong with her like she there's something not right but then the whole house there's something not right about this damn house like and then the bunnies that are around the house oh no no creepy 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 crawly disgusting ew ick no um a lot of weird shit starts to go down um I hated it. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to T. King Fisher. I'm sorry to myself, because I wanted to love this so much. Um, I think that literally half the reason I didn't like this is because I hated the audiobook narrator. I hated the audiobook narrator. Hated, hated it, 
so bad i hated the way they narrated it it's tragic but then i also like i didn't like it i did not like this i didn't like it and i'm so sorry but i really didn't like it i thought it was bad it was like it was too over the top with like the kind of almost like medieval speak i swear i was expecting them to be like my lord or like my lady it was so, i just can't i'm sorry i really didn't like this book i really didn't like it um i thought it was bad sorry to anybody that liked it but i'm not one of them my freaking dome is in the way so let's move you over here a little bit stay thank you i swear am i ever gonna like a book <laughs> this month i swear there are books i liked you will see books I liked, but not right now. Um, I read volume one and two of Bloom Into You, the manga, which in my opinion is misleadingly marketed as a sapphic romance. While there are a lot of sapphic things involved, this is really toxic. This is really toxic. I gave it two stars because, I gave both of them two stars, because there are things about it where I was like, okay like that's kind of interesting like psychologically i guess but you're basically following this girl who has never had a crush on anybody she has never like felt that i thought she was gonna be asexual to be honest but i guess not apparently since it becomes sapphic eventually later down the line but you follow this girl she's never had um feelings for anybody and there is a really beautiful girl that's like basically like the principal uh or not the principal like the president of um the school council and she's stunning okay and she also says that she's never reciprocated feelings for somebody and our main character is like oh my god me too like let's become friends like you understand me and then the other girl is like wait i was lying i have a crush on you what and the main character is like i don't have a crush on you and the other girl is like okay well just like let me be in love with you and you just stand there like don't do anything don't reciprocate i don't want you to reciprocate i like that you don't feel anything for me so you just stand there and just let me be in love with you and you just take it and she's like trying to like kiss her and like hold her hand and touch her and tell her that she loves her and the other girl's like no but then of course or the main character's like no and then the other girl's like oh i love that i okay listen psychologically I can't psychologically I get why that's intriguing but I thought it was toxic so I gave him both two stars good night pun pun it's a really good thing that I am not known in the manga tube community because this would get me canceled I don't um I don't um I don't understand I thought it was terrible I thought it was terrible I thought it was terrible I thought it was so bad and you know what this could very well be that Every person I've ever seen raving about this book is a man and maybe it's not marketed to me. Maybe this is just not marketed for a female audience. That could very well be the case because this is about a young boy, Poon 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 Yami, that is uh, depicted as a character of a bird and his entire family are seen as birds, but everyone else looks like a normal person, okay? You're following him and he has a very, very abusive and toxic home life. But it's like, you can't even figure out who the good guy is because like, there isn't one. Like his dad's a piece of shit. His mom's a manipulative. Okay, his dad is an abusive alcoholic piece of shit. His mom is a emotionally manipulative piece of shit. Basically, they're following this boy and he falls in love with this girl at a school who, if you've read The Flowers of Evil, like just imagine like that dynamic is the girl he falls in love with. Like she's fucking crazy. She's crazy, girl, crazy. And he, he becomes crazy being in love with her. And... I, I'm sorry, let me reel it back. Please tell me down below. Please, if you love this book, I am missing something. This month, apparently, I don't like anything I'm reading. What is it about this that people love so much? Everybody says they cry so hard reading it, and I'm like, no. Okay, I'm gonna stop shitting on this because I'm literally, the manga tube community is gonna come for my fucking throat. Finally, 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 we have something I actually loved. I loved it. What? Who? Oh my god, I actually found some joy in the month of September. What a koi. Love is hard for an otaku. Volume one. Now this is the omnibus version, so it's volume one and two. And when I tell you this couple, I'm obsessed. I fucking love them. I love them so much. Okay, so for the first like third of this, I wasn't sure if I was gonna finish reading it. I was playing on DNFing because it was confusing, it was convoluted, I just like didn't understand any of the references. But then I heard a bunch of people say that the beginning of this book is hard to get into because it was 
put on uh, Pixiv or something, but it was put as like just little comic strips. So the beginning of this is a bound edition of that. So it isn't a continuous storyline. It doesn't really make that much sense. But basically, I mean, it gets better. It gets there. But um, you're following, um, otakus are basically like, in Japan, they're seen as like manga and anime nerds. So you're following otakus and um, he is a gamer and she is a BL or boys love otaku. The other two characters that um, she is a cosplay otaku and he is an anime otaku. And that um, she doesn't want anybody to know that she's an otaku because she, her last boyfriend broke up with her because of that. So she goes to work at this new place and meets him who she used to know when she was a kid and they used to play games together and like read manga together and everything and watch anime. And they were best friends, it was so cute. And they're coming back together and he's like, oh, why don't we just date each other then? Since we're both otakus, I'm gonna just make it easy. It's convenient. So they start dating. And it's fucking cute. It's fucking cute. And then the other two, the other two, oh my God, the friends. Okay, so it's his best friend and her best friend and they're together. And it's like a rivals to lovers, like hate to love. It's so cute. So the other ones, Hanako and Taro. Oh, okay. So they were um, rivaling like the girls uh, volleyball captain and the guys volleyball captain. And they were always fighting each other for like, who was the better team? Who was going to get the gym? And they're just constantly raging at each other. And then when he graduates, he's like, you know, I'm going to miss this. I'm going to miss this banter. And she's like, yeah, me too. And he's like, well, then let's like, let's date it. <laughs> and they start dating. And what I tell you, they have the most like, you, part of me wants to say it's toxic, but their relationship is literally like, they're always yelling at each other. It's just like, he's like, uh, she's like, oh, with that face, nobody would love you. You look like a crazed criminal. And she's like, a crazed criminal. You told this ugly hag that you loved her. So who's the fool now? And I'm like, I fucking love it. I tabbed it. I'm literally obsessed. Five stars. Um, It's so fucking good. Mary by Nat Cassidy. This is a book that I'm gonna go ahead and tell you I need to reread to solidify my opinion on it. This is the Smut Salon book club pick for the month of September. I read the first third of this book physically and then I started listening to the audiobook and I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. The ending got a little freaking convoluted and crazy in my opinion, but it, upon reread, I might change my mind on that. When you're paying tribute to Carrie, that's why this is called Mary. So basically it's supposed to be like if Carrie did not have telekinesis and if she didn't have that prom thing happened, what would have happened to her? Mary, uh, she can't sleep, she can't eat, she's always angry, she has sweats, like she like throws up, passes out, and every time she looks in the mirror, she sees herself decomposing. And when she looks at women that are around her age, which she's 49, she sees them de decomposing. But if they're young women, old women, or men, they're fine. It's freaking creepy. It's creepy, okay? Now, I'm not gonna get into why she does that, what's going on mentally or whatever is happening to her, but it's freaking weird, okay? So the depictions of the grotesque stuff in this book is really good and it's very beautifully written, in my opinion. Like there's a scene where there are beetles crawling out of a little girl's mouth and I was like, like that would be such a good movie. Like this would make a fucking killer movie. So good. But here's the thing. So this is written by a man and it's about menopause, which is a little weird. Now he did his fucking best. Nat Cassidy did his damn best, but he did too much. That's the problem. That's the problem I have this book. He did too much. Like he would bring up all these like problems that women have that they face with like misogyny and like being put on the back burner and not being believed, belittled, like all these different things. And when I tell you, he brings up way too many things that women deal with. Like every single page of this book had a situation of a woman being treated like shit by like the patriarchy and by society and like ageism and ableism and all this stuff. I get it. None of the things that he wrote about are untrue. None of them. All of these things happen to women. But like, listen, I am a woman. I live this shit every day. Like this was too much. There was just too much being done. Like I got it by like the eighth example. I got it. But when we were like on the last couple of pages and we were still talking about it, I was like, you're doing too much. You're bringing up too many things. Like, I got it. I got it. Like, I didn't need another thing. You know what I'm like? Anyway, um, I think I'm gonna give this three and a half stars. Upon reread, it'll probably be a four star. But as of now, three and a half. Then I did a manga taste test video where I was tasting, not tasting, I was testing. Katie, disgusting, sick, you sick bitch. 
I was testing out three new series to see which one was going to get me out of this little reading slump because I'd been hating literally everything I was reading and that's not a fun time for me as a reader. So I was trying these out and these were voted on by my patrons. So I was on a reading sprint and I was like, I will not end these reading sprints until I finish these books. So the first one that they wanted me to read was Moriarty, The Patriot, Volume 1. Now, do you see it? Do you see it? Do you see it? I fucking loved it. I fucking loved it. Spoiler alert, five fucking stars. I loved it. I loved it. Brie from Luck Booktician told me that this was like her new favorite series, like most favorite series. And she's the one that put me on Monster, which I adored. And when she said that, I was like, I'm going to Barnes & Noble right now. Bought it, retail price. So obsessed. I fucking loved it. It's so good. So basically, he is not Moriarty. He's just a random boy. I don't think we ever actually learn his name. He has a brother and they're both in an orphanage, but the Moriarty's have two sons and they're very well to do and um, have a shit ton of money. And basically the older one, Albert is like, I need to be seen as reputable. So I'm gonna go help at this orphanage. He meets this guy, okay. And he's really, really smart. And they start talking about the way that he sees the British Empire and the elites and like the noblemen of the British Empire and how the th top 3% run everything, like all the taxes and legislations and everything. They rule everything and make it so that the poor get poorer and the rich get richer. And his view on all of that and how disgusting it is kind of gets into Albert's head and he's like, yeah, this is fucked up. This is not okay. And he's like, we can change it. So they buddy up together. And then basically, I'm not going to tell you what happens there, but basically this guy, whoever he used to be, becomes a Moriarty. And then it's them on a mission to basically fight the entirety of the British Empire. It's basically like if you took the intelligence of Sherlock, but he was an assassin for hire. That's what this is. Yeah, he kills people. And it's fucking good! It's so good. It's so good. Highly recommend. Absolutely stunning. The next one they wanted me to read was Comey Can't Communicate, Volume 1. And this is basically, I thought, based on the cover, this was going to be, like, sexually explicit. I thought it was going to be erotic romance. It's not. It's not at all. I know that the covers always make you think that, but it's not. So this is basically about Comey, and she has a lot of social anxiety. Like, a lot. Okay? And she cannot communicate. She can't talk with people. Like, if she opens her mouth, if somebody looks at her... And she tries to open her mouth. She completely freezes. Her face freezes. She just like stands there like. But the way that it comes off is that she's stoic and beautiful and too good for you. So everybody in the school is absolutely obsessed with her because she is stunning. But like they think that her just standing there not saying anything means that she's like regal and powerful when really she's like shitting herself, you know? So this guy, Tadano. Rude. Hold please. Baby, I'm back. Hi. <laughs> you know I had to do that, right? Like, that was a necessity. Okay, anyway, what was I saying? To Dano, this boy here, who also has a lot of social anxiety, but surprisingly less than Comey, who he's just always seen as, like, a loser, basically. He recognizes that she has social anxiety, and apparently no one else has ever caught on to that. And he starts writing to her on the blackboard and asks her what her dream is. She says her dream is to make 100 friends. And he's like, well, you only need to make 99 because I'll be your friend. And it's so cute. And he basically takes it as his life mission to help Comey get friends and to help her overcome this communication disorder that she has. And it's very sweet. It's very cute. I really like it. Um, I'm going to give it three stars because I don't love it, but I like it. I think it's good, but I don't love it. And then before we actually pass on to that, I am going to say that I read volume two. And again, I liked it. Didn't love it. There was another thing with another girl in this that weirded me out that I was like, yeah, I can only give this three stars. There's a girl in this that is in love with Comey and like, no, like in love with her, not like adoring. She is like full on sapphic in love with her. So I love that. But the girl is a fucking crazy. She is batshit crazy. Like literally like holding a knife. Like if you don't love me, I'll kill myself. What? So yeah, three stars. There's a lot about it that I liked, um, but not enough about it to give it any higher than the three star, to be honest. Anyway, then I read Free Run Beyond Journey's End. And this was so sad. This was so sad. And if I'd read the summary, which is very short, I would have known going into it and I wouldn't have been sad. 
but I didn't. We're basically following Freerin, which is the mage, this uh, little kind of fairy girl here. And then we also have a priest, a dwarf, and a hero. So they had gone on this 10 year quest to defeat and kill the demon king. And the very beginning of this, is them getting awarded with medals of honor after they've already completed that mission and what happens to a hero after the mission is over. So Freerin, who lives for thousands of years, she went on this 10 year quest and for the three of them who are humans basically, they that 10 years meant a lot. And to her, she's acting like, no, it didn't because she's very flippant. She doesn't really like emotions. And she's like, so anyway, losers, I'm leaving, catch you later. And she comes back 50 years later and they're all like on the brink of death basically, you know, because now they're like 80s and whatnot. And she is so confused by the feeling she has about that because she realizes that she does care and that she regrets basically avoiding her emotions at all costs and distracting herself for 50 years and leaving them to have lives and create memories and relationships with each other that she wasn't a part of. And she doesn't think that she's going to give a shit. And then when she's at um, the funeral of this guy who she really felt a kinship with, she has so much regret. And to nullify that guilt, she goes back to the last 50 years of his life, like retracing his steps and helping the people he didn't get a chance to help or that he wanted to help and trying to kind of relive his life. And it's so sad and it's so beautiful. And like also the art is stunning. It is so beautifully illustrated. It's whimsical, it's intelligent, it's cute. It's sad. It's it's really good. Um, now, I'm going to give it four stars and not five, because while I think this could definitely be five stars for other people, I don't feel myself super drawn to pick up the rest of the series. Like, I will. I'm actually currently reading the second one, but I keep putting it down. And like, it's good when I read it. I like it. But I don't know what it is that like, I think it's that I don't really see where it's going. That's making me want to know what's going to happen next. Everything that happens is good. But there's not like the, the draw. You know what I'm saying? But, but I would definitely suggest it. Then I listened to an audiobook that I had never heard of. I never heard anybody talk about it. And hilariously, just like last week or a couple days ago, Meg mentioned it in a book that she wanted to read in October. And I was like, what? What? Oh my God. Did I like telepathically like send that to her? Like I'm <laughs> what happened? It's True Crime Story by Joseph Knox. This was uh, suggested to me by one of my patrons. Thank you so much. You could not have been more correct. And I was actually buddy reading this with Liana, who's one of my patrons. And we were having the best time. The best time. I'm like, I'm obsessed. But this is a podcast led, like kind of how Serial was, where you actually got like interviews with people and stuff. But this is fiction. But basically Joseph Knox, who is the author, is the main character and it's him who is an author and his friend who's also an author Evelyn is writing him and saying listen like I have this book idea like this book I want to write and it's about this missing girl and it's a true story well, I mean in their world it's a true story uh this missing girl Zoe and they're like she is missing and the um all of the details about her going missing and the family relations, the friend relationships, like her twin sister, the relationship with her father, like um, her boyfriend, like all of this stuff is so fraught and so like just insane that she's like, this is a story I have to continue and everybody would want to read this. It's insane. And he basically keeps backburnering her because he tells her, unless you find a body, nobody's gonna care. Nobody cares about missing girls. They only care about dead girls. And more than that, they care about the person who killed them. They, all, they only wanna hear about the murderer. Like, that's it. And she keeps saying like, this is a story that's worth telling. I really care about this. Like, please, can you read what I've got written and like, give me your input. And he keeps putting it off and putting it off and putting it off. And when he finally does read it, he's like, wow, this is actually really good. And there is a lot of like, I think it's done well, but there is that kind of like jealousy that he feels because he is a well-known author and she's not. And he's like, oh my God, the story is actually really good. Okay. And it's, the audiobook is so good. And every single character has their own narrator and their own voice. And oh my God, I can't, I can't even tell you like what the plot of is of her going missing because when I tell you there's so many plot twists, I had to listen to so many parts of this book twice because I was like, what the fuck just happened? What just happened? Like, what are you talking about? And then I will say, here's the thing. I will say, uh, most of these plot twists, I wouldn't say are technically relevant to figuring out what happened, but are they insane? 
oh my god because it's not like every plot twist is like oh that's relative to what actually happened with her going missing but that's life you know like you can learn something absolutely crazy about somebody and think okay well they have to be the one that did it because they did this other thing that was bad when no people do shitty stuff and it doesn't mean that they're guilty of what you think that they would be guilty of just because they're guilty of something else so basically all these characters things are coming out about them and it's so wild it is wild now like is it messy yes it's messy it's so over dramatic it's dramatic but it's so good like i gave it five stars i thought it was such a good time such a good time like stunning i had such an amazing time reading this book i want to reread it like right now um read it because this book is such an amazing ride my third and last dnf when i was 62 percent of the way through the book is the last housewife by ashley winstead yay i don't get it i don't get it i don't understand like i don't get it i feel like so many people are giving this five stars uh what why i don't get it i i, I i'm serious like i really don't understand I just think this is a book that said, oh, violence toward women, got it. And that's all they wrote. The plot is just violence toward women. And then the action is um, women being treated with violence. And that, that's, that's it. We're not going uphill. I'm going to tell you that. This is a stunning cover, but it's a bad book. It's a very bad book. This is the School for Good Mothers. The concept? interesting the execution terrible terrible okay so you're following this woman who has an 18 month old daughter and she has like not slept for days she's basically a single mom because her husband was cheating on her and got uh divorced her and is like getting married to this new young hot girl that he cheated on her with and she like hasn't slept for days and she's super like sleep deprived and upset and she puts the baby down and leaves her house to go get coffee and time gets away from her and she ends up being gone for two hours. When she gets back, the neighbors have called uh, Child Protective Services on her. Yikes. But in this book, here's the thing, that would definitely happen. This would all happen in real life. But everything after that, no, no. Like Child Protective Services in this book is fucking crazy. So they come pick her up and say, nope, we're taking the child away from you. And then they say, if you want to get your kid back, you have to go for a year to the school for good mothers. And you have to like succeed in this boot camp, basically training. And when she gets there, it's like, it's prison for starters. It's a prison. It's a cult prison. Okay. And they give her this like fake baby, a doll, like an AI doll that is exactly like a human being. Like there's, you can't tell at all that it's not real and says you have to mother this daughter perfectly and do everything perfectly and also you can't talk to your kid it's so hyperbolic like it's just everything is on not just the 10th degree it's on the upteenth degree it's freaking crazy it's crazy and it, it made me so mad literally this book made me so freaking angry so angry because the things that happen to this woman that get said to her are just absurd like it's just so absurd like literally they're like teaching her how to hug a kid and they say it can't last for any longer than eight seconds and eight seconds is only for dire situations okay like what what the, what the fuck are you talking about like okay and when i tell you that there's a school for bad fathers and there's like a fifth of the population there than there is at the school for good mothers and the guys get treated exquisitely disgusting also also the mantra at this school is that the moms have to say every day multiple times a day they have to say i'm a bad mother because blank but i'm working like on getting better and i was like that is toxic and disgusting one star i am so surprised that this is doing so well like i, I did not see this coming i thought it was all gonna a tower was going to fall there eventually. But I have one last book that I read for this month, and it is True Crime Addict. Now, after I read True Crime Story, I was like, I need more of this, okay? This book is so fucking boring. This book is so boring. So it's a, I'm not going to even go into the plot because it's literally so boring. It's so boring. He's also trying to find a missing girl, but he's doing it out of obsession. He doesn't even give a shit about the girl. 
He literally is like, I don't care if she's dead or not. Like, I just want to figure it out. So he's obsessively for his little podcast, uh, not his podcast. It's for a book he's trying to write. Okay. He's trying to write a book about this missing girl and he only cares about himself. He only cares about number one and he's like going out and literally it's so disgusting. Like he'll go up to the family members and he's knocking on the door and then he'll like sneak into their apartment complex and just sit there like in the hall waiting for them to walk by to bombard them with questions and doesn't seem to see how that's not okay. What are you talking about? No, sir. No. The ending is so, it's not just bad. It's not just bad. It's so unsatisfying. The ending is so unsatisfying. There's no way. That's how they ended the book. Like you, you couldn't come up with an ending. So you just said, oh, well, that's the end. What? And then, okay, so this is another reason why I hate the main character. His wife asks him, why are you so obsessed with this story? Like, what is it about this story that makes you so obsessed that even though it's dangerous, you want to continue verbatim, verbatim. He says, because I know that I'm smarter than whoever did whatever they did to her. I'm smarter than them. And I want to figure it out. Really? Um, because as of now, you have not proven to be intelligent. So I just don't, I don't understand what you're talking about. Yeah, um, it was one star. I, I highly, highly do not recommend. Okay, friends, that is going to wrap it up for all of the 19 books that I read or attempted to complete in the month of September. There are going to be like, I think... 10 books that I read this month that are going into a vlog that's going to come out for next month. So stay tuned for that. And also I will try to remember to have links down below to any of the vlogs that any of these are in. If you want to watch those and get more in-depth thoughts, you totally could. If you want to follow me on Goodreads, Patreon, Instagram, any of such, they are going to be linked down below. And if you've gotten this far into the video, we could leave the, uh, there's got to be a school icon like a school, right? There has to be. So leave the school. If you've gotten this far into the video and you don't know what to comment, you can leave that. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you are having an amazing day, evening, night, dusk, dawn, whatever it is you're having in whatever part of the world you are currently having it in. And I will see you in a video coming very soon. Bye.